أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Good night everyone Today is March 8th, 2023 We have approximately 30, 13 days until the month of Ramadan, alhamdulillah uh, Thank you for tuning in If you're here, please share this live Alhamdulillah. So tonight is uh, the beginning of Bambar's third annual pre-Ramadan lecture series. Alhamdulillah. And my name is Sister Mokhtara. For those who don't know, I am the founder of Bambar, a uh, Black American Muslims born and raised. Um, I started this platform in about 2020, and it is geared towards Black American Muslims and, and our experience, right? Uh, those who were born and raised into the Dean. Alhamdulillah. So tonight, Alhamdulillah, we have a special guest. Um, Brother Ibrahim Jabber, alhamdulillah, from the Jabber family, and we have Sister Anaya Robinson, and she will be re reciting some verses from the Quran, alhamdulillah, and I pray that everybody that's tuning in will be able to benefit from this lecture, alhamdulillah, this is, we started this in about 2021 during the pandemic, uh, we was kind of in lockdown still, and uh, we thought that this would be a great initiative to help the Muslims, especially, you know, that was, you know, home and doing the whole virtual thing to get ready uh, for the month of Ramadan, inshallah. So I pray that everybody uh, benefits from this program, inshallah. And I cannot wait to hear from Brother Ibrahim and hear Sister Anaya's beautiful recitation, mashallah. Okay, so I'm going to read her bio, inshallah. Um, let me just pull it up. And... Let's see. Sorry, y'all. <laughs> okay. Who is it? Hold on. I'm sorry, y'all. Coming and coming. Um, we'll just read it from here. The phone. Okay, Anaya Robinson is a 19 year old fourth generation Muslim. Her grandmother accepted Islam at the age of 88. She lived in Medina Bay, Senegal for four years while memorizing half of the Quran at the African American Islamic Institute of the late Imam Hassan Sise. Afterwards, she studied Islamic knowledge in Morocco at the, at the prestigious All Girls Institute, Zainab Um El Mu'minin and then in Tennessee under the tutelage of her uncle, Imam Hamza Abdul Malik. She is currently a student at Zaytuna College at Berkeley, Col at, uh, Co um, Zaytuna College at Berkeley, California, where she studies the Western and Islamic traditions. Anaya will be reciting verses 57 to 65 from Surah Tal Yusuf in the worst style of recitation, inshallah. Alhamdulillah. Shukran Anaya for being here with us. And you may proceed, inshallah. Bismillah, ربكم وشفاء وشفاء لما في الصدور وهدى ورحمة للمؤمنين قل بفضل الله وبرحمته فبذلك فليفرح هو خير Sulaytun. <laughs> وما ظن الذين يفترون على الله الكذب يوم القيامة إن الله لذو فضل لذو فضل على الناس ولكن أكثرهم لا يشكرون 
وَمَا تَكُونُ فِي شَأْنٍ وَمَا تَتْلُو مِنْهُ مِنْ قُرْآنٍ وَلَا تَعْمَلُونَ مِنْ عَمَلٍ وما يعزب أن ربك من مثقال ذوة في الأرض ولا في السماء ولا في السماء ولا أصغر من ذلك ولا أكبر إلا في كتاب ألا إن أولياء ألا إن أولياء الله لا خوف عليهم ولا يحزنون الذين آمنوا وكانوا يتقون لهم البشرى في الحياة الدنيا وفي الآخرة لهم البشرى في الحياة الدنيا وفي الآخرة لا تبديل لكلمات الله ذلك هو الفوز العظيم ولا يحزنك قولهم إن العزة لله جميعا هو السميع العليم رب العظيم O oh, humanity, indeed there has come to you a warning from your Lord and a cure for what is in the hearts, a guide and a mercy for the believers. Say, O oh, Prophet, in Allah's grace and mercy, let them rejoice. That is far better than whatever wealth they amass. Ask the pagans, O oh, Prophet, have you seen that which Allah has sent down for you as a provision? of which you have made some lawful and some unlawful? Say, has Allah given you authorization or are you fabricating lies against Allah? What do those who fabricate lies against Allah expect on judgment day? Surely Allah is ever bountiful to humanity, but most of them are ungrateful. There is no activity you may be engaged in or portion of the Qur'an you may be reciting, or any deed you all may be doing, except that we are a witness over you while doing it. Not even an atom's weight is hidden from your Lord on earth or in heaven, nor anything smaller or larger than that, but it's written in a perfect record. There will certainly be no fear for the close servants of Allah, nor will they grieve. They are those who are grateful and are mindful of him. For them is good news in this worldly life and the hereafter. There is no change in the promise of Allah. That is truly the ultimate triumph. Do not let their words grieve you, O Prophet. Surely all honor and power belongs to Allah. He is the all-hearing, all-knowing. Mashallah. Shukran, thank you so much for that beautiful recitation. And I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continue to bless you on your studies. Amen. Um, Thank you very much. Welcome, alhamdulillah. So alhamdulillah, next we have uh, our brother Khalil, Ismail, mashallah. Uh, he is a band bar day one. <laughs> when I started this group, he was one of the very first brothers that came forth and this helped with so much. I, I mean, subhanAllah. So thank you for being here, Khalil. Alhamdulillah. No problem, alhamdulillah. <laughs> and he will be reading uh, Brother Ibrahim's bio, inshallah. All right. Um, so, Rahim, salam alaikum, everyone. Good to see y'all. Um, hopefully, Brother Ibrahim is close. Um, so, uh, just just came to read his bio um, and also trigger, try to figure out what he's drinking because he's he, he looked like he got the fountain of youth with him. I, I remember working with him I mean, working with him like past 10 years and you know he still looked the same he looks exactly the same i'm walking right here with gray hairs and all this other stuff in my beard he was doing poetry around the country for 10 15 years ago so mashallah, mashallah. for that so, 
Make sure you turn. All right, alhamdulillah. So we're gonna get to it. Um uh um yeah, let me let me know. I, <laughs> let me <laughs> let me know what you're doing. I, <laughs> um <laughs> mashallah. So Ibrahim Jabba is the third generation American born Muslim of Arab African descent. His roots go back to Mali, West Africa, from where his great great grandfather was kidnapped at the tender age of six and sold into slavery. His family comes from the oldest indigenous Sunni Muslim community established on American soil dating back to the late 1920s. His grandfather, Hajj Hisham Jabber, performed the Janazah prayer uh, and burial of Malcolm X. Ibrahim is a student of knowledge, alumni of the University of Pennsylvania and a, Cam a Cambridge ADR fellow. He is also a former professional basketball player and Philadelphia Basketball Hall of Famer. Ibrahim is a published author, poet, teacher, and mentor. He is the founder of Color Me Muslim and the current youth director at IECPA, Islamic Educational Center of PA. So um, it's all yours, my brother Ibrahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And um, thank you very much uh, for the introduction. Um, I don't think I would have had anybody else introduce me uh, than you, uh, my beloved brother Khalid Ismail, always pioneering um, in many different capacities. Um, it's an honor and a privilege to be here to share with you all. And hopefully um, I will benefit and, and you will benefit, inshallah, and we'll all come out from this session better than we came in inshallah tyler um and as for your uh, question about what keeps me young they have uh an expression in the arabic language that whoever grows up with the quran men them al quran whoever you know spends his youth with the quran then the quran will keep him young <laughs> um and when i was 13 years old my father he came to me and i was in the at the end of my seventh grade year of um, middle school, we just won the basketball championship. And I had my heart set on going back to my eighth grade year, being the star player on the team um, and trying to have a, a repeat. Uh, but my father had different plans and Allah Ta'ala, he had different plans. And he came to me and he said that we're moving to Morocco, right? And at that time in the nineties, believe it or not, um, Morocco sounded like the moon. <laughs> like we're going to Morocco what's Morocco you know um and so I reluctant I reluctantly um embrace my father's wishes and I went on that journey and that was the beginning of my personal journey I would say um with the Quran and so we started memorizing the Quran and we started learning the Arabic language which would actually assist us in learning and understanding um, the Quran and internalizing its meanings and uh, ultimately being shaped by the Quran, right? And so that is my topic today, right? Being shaped by the Quran, being transformed and molded by the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? And uh, to begin formally, inshallah, bismillah, uh, walhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah. I want to begin, inshallah, with a little bit of poetry as it uh, relates to the topic at hand. <clears throat> In the name of Allah, I begin. I praise him before I raise my pen. I seek refuge in him from the evil within and the enticing whispers of mankind and jinn. O oh Allah, won't you guide my pen, make right what I write, and erase my sins. Thereafter, I extend the best of salutations to the best and the most blessed of Allah's creation, the last of all prophets and a mercy to all nations. In his example, there is love. In his footsteps, there is salvation. And to bear witness to his greatness is one of the highest declarations for the messenger of Allah is a praiseworthy station. And to Allah, the most high is the greatest obligation. Allah perfects his light without need of his creation. Rather, we are in need of our deeds and supplications. So may these words find acceptance in the highest congregation and in this life and the next be a means of elevation allahumma amin one of the poems that i wrote in my new book collection entitled touch of gold begins everything the quran touches turns to gold 
So don't be afraid to let it touch your soul. Um, and for some, this may sound like somewhat of an exaggeration, but in reality, when we look at the proofs and the evidence, we would find that everything the Quran is associated with, it is elevated and it is deemed virtuous by virtue of association with the Quran, right? And Allah Ta'ala, he says, uh, Alif Lam Ra, the beginning of Surah Ibrahim, Kitabun Anzalnahu Ilayka, a book that we have sent down upon you, speaking to the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, li tukhrija nasa min al-dhulumati ila nur, that you would bring mankind out from darknesses into the light. Bi idni rabbihim ila sirat al-aziz al-hamid, by the permission of their Lord to the path of al-aziz al-hamid, the one who is mighty, and the one who is ever worthy of praise, right? And this verse tells us that the kitab, the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the specific reason that it was sent down, the general reason that it was sent down was to bring mankind out of darkness and into the light, right? And all of us, we have darknesses in our lives, whether they be external darknesses that surround us, right? Um, you know, ignorance, disbelief, right? Chaos, corruption, vice, sin, all of these things that surrounding us externally, and then also internal forms of darkness as well. The darknesses of doubts that sometimes cloud our, our judgment and our clarity regarding our faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The darknesses of desire that oftentimes would get the best of us, right? And cause us to fall into sin and transgression and violate others, right? Let alone violate ourselves, right? So we all have darknesses in our lives and to bring us out of that darkness, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directed us to the Quran, why? Because the Quran, it is a transformative book and everything associated with the Quran is immediately upgraded in status and virtue. And this was from the very, very onset of the revelation that the Prophet والسلام, for 40 years was known, uh, of course, for his virtue, but he was considered a common man from amongst a common people, right? Not known to the rest of the world. Right, until one day he went into that cave, right, where he would receive revelation and he entered that cave as Muhammad, the son of Ibn Abdullah, right, the son of Abdullah. But when he came out from that cave, he was no longer just Muhammad Ibn Abdullah, Muhammad, the son of Abdullah, but he was now Muhammad Rasulullah, right? And that is an immediate transformation that happened based on the revelation of the Quran. And that transformation didn't stop with him as an individual, but it impacted uh, his family. It impacted his closest friends and it transformed that society, right? Entirely a backward society that was just upon falsehood and ignorance. They had been uh, burying their, their daughters alive, right? Women were being treated as, as property right? And the Quran came to, to rescue them, right? And to bring them out of that type of ignorance, right? Into the guidance and the light of Al-Islam, right? And to illustrate the virtue uh, of just being associated with the Quran, right? And we'll talk about the requirements of being people of the Quran, inshallah, once we get beyond this, this uh, juncture right here. But just to highlight uh, the virtue of being associated with the Quran to, and to bring that point home that everything the Quran touches turns to gold, right? The Quran is the greatest revelation, right? Of all of the revelations that Allah Ta'ala revealed, it is the greatest and it is the purest and it is the most preserved and it is an authority over all previous revelations that were sent before it. Everything concedes to the Quran, right? So whatever the Quran approve of, we approve of it, 
And whatever the Quran rejects, then we have to reject that. And whatever the Quran is silent about, then we are also silent about that. So the Quran is muhaymin. It is an authority, right, in our lives, right? And this has to have uh, manifestations in our actions, in our thinking, right? Oftentimes, when something happens in our life, we judge based on emotion or we judge based on the context of our society. What is the common uh, approach to this particular issue, right? And we sometimes internalize ideas and philosophies subconsciously without even knowing it. To the point that if I ask you in, what, in a situation, how would you respond, right? Many people wouldn't even turn to the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right, but the Quran as an authority, it should be our first reference point. Any given situation that you face in life, you should be looking for an ayah in the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to actually support uh, your position. Right. Um, and you know, the Quran. So, number one, the Quran is the greatest revelation, right? And it is an authority for us and a reference point. And I always tell this story about uh, an incident when I was studying in Egypt um, and I was teaching my son some of the meanings of the Quran. And we were going over one surah where it says, uh, that the human being is created unstable, right? Uh, when something of harm touches him, then you know he becomes bothered and annoyed and frustrated and when good touches him then he becomes covetous clinging on to it for dear life right and this was a small lesson of tafsir that i was going through with my six uh, seven year old son right and subhanallah something happened uh later on that day or later on that week to one of my younger daughters and she started to cry. Maybe she fell to the ground or she tripped or something of this nature. And in that moment when she began to cry, my son subliminally or subconsciously started to recite that verse. That whenever harm touches them, then they become bothered and, and frustrated, right? So having the Quran as a reference point, right? In, in the way that we interpret the things that happen around us in the life of this world, right? Is a part of the makeup of the Muslim, right? Now, number two is the Quran is the greatest miracle, greater than all of the physical miracles that have ever taken place, including the splitting of the moon and the parting of the sea, right? Because the Quran is more lasting. Those miracles, they were only witnessed in a, a very, very isolated moment in time. But the Quran is an eternal miracle, not from the creation, but from the uncreated speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we are able to witness it and experience it and to taste it, right? And it's been more than 1400 years that miracle is still, you know, revealing itself to us in, in many different ways. Right, you go back to the Quran and you find in it a verse that you, you know, never understood its meaning before. Right, but it speaks to you in that moment, it meets you where you are. Right, and that is of the greatest miracles of the Quran. Right, that it is timeless. Right, and the Quran was revealed in the most eloquent of languages, right, which is the Arabic language. Right. And the Arabic language has the capacity to produce, you know, uh, profound and precise meanings. It is lisan on Arabi on Mubin. It is the clear Arabic tongue, right, that leaves no doubt. It leaves no confusion just because of the features, right, that the language possesses that are unique specifically to the Arabic language. And for that reason, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he chose it so that you could comprehend, so that you could understand.
right? And the Quran, it was rebuilt, re, uh, revealed in the best two places under the sun, right? Which is Mecca and Medina, right? So we see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he chose the best of the best for his Quran, Right, everything the Quran touches turns to gold, so don't be afraid to let it touch your soul. The prayer in Mecca at the Haram Al Kaaba is a hundred thousand times more than a prayer anywhere else in any other place except for Medina, which is a thousand times better. Right, that means that if you get the reward of 27 for praying in congregation then you can multiply that by 100,000 <laughs> when you pray at the Haram in Mecca, 2.7 billion rewards for one prayer, right? Um, and of course, it was revealed in the best of all months, the noblest month, which is the month of Ramadan. And this is the month that we are anticipating its arrival nearly or just under two weeks away, right? Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala distinguish the month of Ramadan for his Quran, right? And even in the Quran, the only month that is mentioned by name for those who know is the month of Ramadan, right? No other month is mentioned by name except for the month of Ramadan. And its mention is by virtue of its relationship to the Quran. And so the verse says, Shahru Ramadan Levi Unzila Fihil Quran. Right? The month of Ramadan, the month wherein the Quran was revealed. Right? And so its virtue is by virtue of its association to the Quran. And not only was it revealed in the best of months, but within that month, it was revealed in the best of nights. As Allah Ta'ala says, Inna and Zanahu fi Laylatil Qadr. Right, that's right. Everybody knows this verse, right? We revealed this Quran in the night of decree or the night of power, right? And this is a night that if you uh, achieve its reward, you will be rewarded more than khayrun, more than 1,000 months, right? Some people say the reward of 1,000 months, but that's not exactly accurate. Allah Ta'ala says khayrun min al fishal, which means better than a thousand months, right? And the completion of his revelation was on Yom al Arafah, right? Al Yom Akmeltu Lakum Dinakum, right? Which is the greatest day of the entire year, right? And so <laughs> by virtue of the Quran, everything is elevated. And for his Quran, he chose Jibril, alayhi salam, the noblest of all angels, the trustworthy of the heavens, Ruh al Amin. And he chose the greatest of all prophets, right? The Imam of the Nabiyin, which is the Prophet والسلام, khayrul khalqi, the best of Allah's creation, right? And he chose him for this task. And there's another subtlety that we find the Quran was revealed upon his heart, right? Musa alayhi salam, he was given tablets. Ibrahim alayhi salam, he was given suhuf, he was given scrolls. But the Quran specifically was revealed upon the heart, right? Ala qalbika litakuna min al mundirin, upon your heart so that you could be upon those who warn, right? And this is significant because the heart is the master of the limbs, right? And in the hadith, the Prophet والسلام, said that in the body, there's a morsel of flesh that if it is sound, then the entire body will be sound. <inaudible> Behold, and that morsel of flesh, it is the heart. So the best part of the best person, right? This Quran was revealed upon it, right? And also the heart is the source of the human problem. Right, the desires that we have in our heart is truly what brings about conflict between one and another. Right, I desire one thing and you desire something else. And so we have a clash, right? Or I desire one thing and you desire the exact same thing, but there's only one, <laughs> right? And oftentimes because uh, we are unable to tame our desires, we end up in confrontations and, and clashes, right? Over what? The heart. 
And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he went directly to the source of the human problem by revealing it upon the hearts, right? By putting an emphasis upon, right? Having this Quran impact our hearts from the very, very beginning, right? And then last but not least, number 10, the Quran was given to the best of all nations. Kuntum khayra ummatin ukhrijat linnas. You are the best nation ever brought forth for the benefit of mankind. And from that nation, it was revealed upon Khairun Nasi Qarni, the best generation, which was the generation of the Prophet والسلام, And he himself, he said that the best of you, Khairukum and Ta'allam al Qur'an wa Allama, is the one who uh, learns the Quran and teaches the Quran. So I say it again. Everything the Quran touches turns to gold. So don't be afraid to let it touch your soul, right? And to move forward now to the teeth of the topic, which is modeling our character after the Quran, shaping, being shaped by the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, which means that in translation, indeed, this Quran, right? It guides to that which is aqwam. And aqwam means that which is most upright or that which is most uh, virtuous, right? And in the Arabic language, it is a superlative expression, right? Isn't tafdil, meaning that with which there is nothing beyond it, right? So this verse is not just saying that Quran is guiding us to virtue. No, it's saying that it's guiding us to the type of virtue that, that there is nothing beyond it, right? And this tells us that a Muslim should never be outdone in terms of virtue and character, right? We're not being asked to be mediocre in terms of our character. No, we're, asked, we're being asked to be superlative in terms of our character, right? And just like we say, Allahu Akbar, right? The word Akbar is superlative, right? Allah is the greatest, meaning that there is nothing, there's no greatness beyond the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? And likewise, there's no virtue beyond what the Quran specifically is calling us to, right? And the greatest proof of this is none other than the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, right? And Allah Ta'ala, he testified to the character of the Prophet والسلام, when he said, Wa innaka la ala khuluqin azim, that, and this is double emphatic, right? To do away with the doubts and to uh, testify against the false accusations of the Prophet والسلام, Allah Ta'ala, he swears, Wa innaka la ala, right? That you are upon an exalted character that your character is not average, it is not mediocre, your, char your character is superlative, right? Your character is, is amazing, which is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, testifying to the character of the Prophet And then we have the testimony of Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, when she was asked about the character of the Prophet And this is a lesson for us all, Right. And I try to especially teach this to many of the youth that I work with. Right. Asking the valuable question. Right. The question that is going to bring us the most benefit. So they're going to the wife of the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam, and they want to take from her something that they can, you know, implement and benefit from in their life. Right. And so they asked about his character. Right. They, because they want to come closer to the Prophet والسلام, and his example, because his example is beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so whoever follows and embodies his example could also attain the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
right? And that's the meaning of the verse that if you love Allah, then follow me, then Allah will love you, right? Because the model of loving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, And the model of receiving the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. Right. So if we want to know of the most virtuous principles, we have to look at the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if we want to know the reality and the manifestation of that, then we have to look at the example of the Prophet. So what did his wife Aisha reply? She said, Do you not read the Quran? فَإِنَّ خُلُقَ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ كَانَ الْقُرْآنِ صلى الله عليه وسلم Because the character of the Prophet والسلام, it was nothing other than the Qur'an, right? And they, the scholars explain what this means as well. For clarification, they said, أَنَّهُ كَانَ يَتَأَدَّبُ بِآدَابِهِ وَيَتَخَلَّقُ بِأَخْلَاقِهِ That they used to, the Prophet والسلام, used to embody the ethics and the adab, which is uh, the morals of the Quran, the moral code of the Quran, he embodied it. And he used to embody its characteristics or the characteristics that were approved of by or in the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? And so again, the Quran calls to that which is most virtuous. And the greatest proof of that is the Prophet والسلام, who obviously has the greatest character of all and his character by testimony of his wife was the Quran, right? In fact, in another narration, it says that he was the Quran walking on the earth, <laughs> right? The Quran walking, right? And many of us, we talk Quran, Right, we memorize Quran, we quote Quran, but the Prophet والسلام, he walked Quran. Right, he embodied Quran, he lived Quran. Right, and this is really, really, really profound when you really think about it. Right, because to internalize something to the point where it becomes a part of you is not always an easy, straightforward process. Right, and a great example of that is the hadith in the Malamalu bin Niyat, right? That all actions are by intention, right? Very, very easy to memorize, very, very short hadith. It's mentioned first in, in Bukhari, it's mentioned Imam al Noah, he mentioned it first, right? Not because of its simplicity, but because of the weight that it carries, <laughs> because of the, the significance and the importance of, right, actually embodying that particular. Uh, uh, narration and that particular principle. But we know that our intention is something that we can wrestle with our entire, our entire life. Something that we can actually struggle to master, right, for 60 to 100 years, <laughs> just one narration, right? Now compare that to the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam, who not only mastered that hadith, <laughs> Right, but every single verse of the Quran, he internalized it. Right, and his companions, when they used to go back and study the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they would study it verse by verse and they would take 10 verses at a time and they wouldn't move on from those verses until they understood its meanings, until they were able to actually internalize the realities, you know, that were being spoken about in those verses. Right. So they would actually try to uh, shape themselves and mold themselves and come closer and closer to the virtues of the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right. In fact, the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam, he said himself, that the only reason that I was sent was to perfect. And this is a weighty statement. Right, the only reason that I was sent was to perfect the righteous character. Right, all of what his mission summarized in this statement is the akhlaq, modeling our akhlaq, our character after the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I always tell the people, I don't care how many days you fast, 
can fast 30 days. And I don't care how many times you complete the recitation of the Quran, right? If your character has not improved through that journey of reflecting and revisiting the ayat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then what have you truly gained from your month of Ramadan, right? This is not just a mental exercise, right? And an exercise of the tongue to see how much we can read the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but the true victor and the wise person, he's reading those verses intent on improving himself, refining himself, right? And this is the reality of why the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it was sent, right? And in terms of the impact of the Quran, I want to give us an example of how it impacts our disposition and our mood, even subliminally, even beyond our own realization, right? Take, for example, Surah Kaf. This is the 18th chapter of the Quran, a, a chapter that is recommended to be revisited uh, every Friday, right? And a part of the reason why is to actually refresh certain sentiments inside of us, to keep those sentiments alive. So what's happening in Surah Kaf that we revisit so often, right? If you look at Surah Kaf, one of the common themes is that the powerful versus the powerless, right? The first story is the youth and they are seeking asylum in the cave, right? And their lives are at threat, right? As they mention themselves that, you know, if anybody discovers you, they may stone you to death or they may return you to your or their religion, right? So they flee to the cave. We have the powerless versus the powerful. Right. And I'm asking you now without expecting any response. Right. Who are you rooting for in that situation? Right. Unknowingly, subconsciously, your heart is inclining towards those youth. You want them to be saved. Right. And then you have the story of the two gardens and you have this wealthy, rich, obnoxious individual. He, he's insulting, you know, his companion. Right. And he's bragging about his wealth and, you know, he's behaving uh, in such a way that is so distasteful. Right. And who are you rooting for in that situation? Subconsciously, you're not thinking about it, but you don't really like that guy. Right. He's, you know, boasting and bragging and he's so arrogant. Right. That you can't wait until he trips over and fall on his face. Right. <laughs> Right. And then you have the story of Musa and Khidr. And one of the first stops is a group of poor people who working on the sea. And behind them is this tyrannical king. And he wants to seize every ship, you know, this, whether it belongs to the poor or to the rich. Right. And in that situation, Khidr intervenes and he scuttles the boat. Right so that he could protect the powerless here against the powerful. And then finally, you have the story of these uh, people who barely understood a, a word when Dhul Qarnayn came to them and they were being oppressed by Ajuj and Ma'juj, right? And so the one who was actually reading and reflecting upon this chapter, they should find his heart inclined or their heart inclined towards the powerless, right? Without even knowing it. Right. And when Allah Ta'ala comes to their aid, as he does in each of those cases, the reader should find a sense of, of comfort and contentment in that. They should find a sense of relief when Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala brings his rahmah, right, his mercy. Right. And so now we have read this chapter. And we have internalized some of its meanings. And we have revised from some of those sentiments inside of our hearts. And then we go out our door. Back to the real world. And we go out into the dunya. And we witness injustice. We witness oppression. We witness this same, this same scenario in real time of, of the powerful versus the powerless. <laughs> right? And so what should be happening in our hearts? Right? Without us even knowing it, 
our heart again starts to incline towards the poor. It starts to incline towards the oppressed, the downtrodden, and the underprivileged, right? And this is the subliminal impact of the Quran, right? On our heart and also on our character. And this is why Allah Ta'ala, he said, uh, that everything we relate to you from the stories of the messengers, right? Right? Uh, is what we make firm by it, your hearts. Or we make your hearts firm by it, right? These stories and these narrations that we're, we're reading in the Quran, right? Narrations and stories of the highest virtue. And I want to go to a few verses um, to show you the elevated virtue that we're being called to from the Quran. I'm not sure exactly how much time I have left, um, but I will continue inshallah and I'll look for those messages coming in uh, just to remind me of how much time, right? But one of the high virtues that the Quran calls us to is something that they call now altruism, right? Selflessness, or rather the preference, ethel, the preference of others over yourself, right? And in the lifetime of the Prophet, والسلام, a man from the Ansar, he was uh, on the brink of star starvation, is what we uh, detect from the narration. And so he came to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam asking, and the Messenger of Allah himself had nothing to give, right? Because he always led by example. If they had one rock on their stomach, then the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had two rocks to quiet his hunger pains, right? So he always led by example. And so he inquired to see who would be able to host this man. And the individual that took it upon himself to host this man from the Ansar he barely had enough food for himself and his family, right? And on top of that, he had young children, right? But he stood up to the challenge and he took in this Ansari man and he went to his wife, you know, in advance to inform her that we would be giving up our meal for the night, right? And that she should put the children to bed without having their meal and that, when the individual comes, he wants her to put out the light. You know, they have the lanterns to put it out as if they have no more fuel left. And that they would give him the food and they would only pretend <laughs> as though they were eating, you know, hitting the, the fork on the plate, right? As though they were eating, right? And this is virtuous in and of itself. Why would they do this? Why would they not just give him the food? right? They did this because they didn't want him to feel uncomfortable for having taken their only meal, right? So to actually cover up their own situation, you know, um, so that the, the one who was in need would not feel uncomfortable, right? And because of this incident, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he revealed as the Prophet والسلام, informed the man the next morning, and they prefer others over themselves despite being in need, despite already being in need, right? And whoever um, overcomes the covetousness of his own soul, then those are the ones who are the successful. These are the virtues that the Quran is calling us to. Right. And indeed, it is more virtuous. Right. To be the one to put the smile on the other person's face. Right. Most of us, we're worried about our own smile most of the time. Right. And, you know, we're content with receiving the smile. Right. But the more virtuous thing is to even sacrifice your own smile at times, as our mothers did, as our fathers did, as our grandparents did. Right. And as we do as parents now to make sure that other people have a smile on their face. Right. And this is where we take our greater fulfillment in the happiness of others. Right. And so the Quran is calling us to this characteristic of altruism. Just recently, 
we had an organization come to my masjid for a fundraiser. And the original intent of that fundraiser was to support people in Yemen, right? Because they were in, and they are in dire need. But it happened that the fundraiser landed within the weeks after the earthquake in Turkey and Syria. And so instead of raising money for people in Yemen, the organization, they sacrificed their campaign that day and they raised money for people in Tur Turkey and, and Syria instead, right? And so this is a manifestation of that quality of preferring others over ourselves, right? And another characteristic, I just want to open uh, the chat here, inshallah. Mashallah, you're, you're good with time, alhamdulillah. Okay, alhamdulillah. <laughs> alhamdulillah. Now, another characteristic that is highlighted in the Quran, and we see this uh, in several different scenarios, right? And it is to never take advantage of others and to never abuse power, right? One of the uh, demographics that is most highlighted in the Quran because of their vulnerability is the orphans, right? Because they are the most easy to take advantage of them. Right. And Allah Ta'ala he says, don't you dare come near their wealth, <laughs> except with that which is better. Right. And it tells us, don't take advantage of those who are in need. Right. And don't abuse power. Right. Allah Ta'ala says, Wa la nun which means don't do a favor seeking increase. Right. Don't do someone a favor because if you do it for the sake of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and your intention is for Allah, right then what increase do you want from the people, right? So he says, don't do a favor seeking increase. Sometimes we do something just to get somebody in our pocket, right? Just, oh, this guy, he owes me a favor now. He owes me something because I did such and such for him or for her in the past, right? Allah Ta'ala says, no, right? That is not the way of the believer. A business transaction is a business transaction right? But this type of transaction, right, then is something separate from business, right? So if you do a favor for someone for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then you should, you shouldn't, right, expect something in return, right? And Dhul Qarnayn, as I mentioned, Surah Kaf, he comes to the people being oppressed by Yajuj and Majuj, and they ask him to build a barrier, Right, and he has dominion from the east to the west, right, wherever the sun rises and sets, right? And so they ask him, and they also offer to pay him, right? And he refuses the payment from them, right? Saying in the most uh, virtuous way, refusing, saying that what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has established me with is, uh, is better, it is sufficient, right? So he's recognizing, number one, that I'm not in need of this. I'm not just going to take a wage just because I can take a wage, right? He recognizes that there's there's virtue, you know, in refusing money at times, right? I, I'm already sufficient. I'm taken care of, right? But he did have a need, and that need was for human support, right? So help me actually physically because I won't be able to accomplish this myself. But when it came to the money, he was already established. He didn't need that, right? And so he waived that, right? And he didn't take advantage of them in that needy situation or abuse his power, right? Likewise, repelling evil with good. You know, um, in our society, you know, uh, in our times, we want to fight fire with fire, right? An eye for an eye, right? You know, an ear for an ear, tooth for a tooth. And there is a context for that, right? But the default is not that. The default is to repel evil with good, right? How do we know that? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of course, the example of the Prophet والسلام, was that. And he was the epitome of repelling evil with good. And we can mention so many different narrations that highlight that particular characteristic, 
right? But again, we go to the book of Allah for the principle, and then we see the reality manifested in the Prophet والسلام, right? Allah Ta'ala says, وَلَا تَسْتَوِي الْحَسَنَةُ السَّيِّئَةِ That good and evil are by no means equal. So push back, right, with that which is better, right? Not fighting fire with fire, but fighting, extinguishing the fire with your lights, right? <laughs> uh, and then he says, فَإِذَا الَّذِي بَيْنَكَ وَبَيْنَهُ عَدَاوَةٌ كَأَنَّهُ وَلِيٌّ حَمِيمٌ Right, and look at the beautiful results when you repel evil with good, right? If you fight fire with fire, you're not going to become friends at the end of the day, right? Your enemy is going to remain your enemy until death, so long as you fight fire with fire, right? But Allah Ta'ala says the result of fighting uh, or repelling evil with good is that the one who was your staunch enemy could all of a sudden become like your best friend like a very, very close, intimate companion, right? Because you dealt with that person with virtue, right? And they respected you for that and you changed their outlook and their impression, right? And we know that so many people in the lifetime of the Prophet, والسلام, <laughs> right, were his enemies and they hated him so much, right? Only years later to become of his best friends and he would become to them the most beloved person right you know ever to walk the face of the earth right so islam the quran is calling us to repel evil with good right and then to take the higher road right so often we want to stoop to the level of those who are trying to pull us down right only to end up you know degrading our own selves, you know, and losing our dignity in the process, you know, um, may Allah forgive us and may Allah protect us, right? Don't stoop to the level of those trying to put, pull you down, right? Take the higher road. And when you take the higher road, you would maintain your dignity in the process, right? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says in one of my favorite chapters in the Quran, Surah Al-Furqan, وَعِبَادُ الرَّحْمَانَ الَّذِينَ يَمْشُونَ عَلَى الْعَرُضِ هَوْنَا And the servants of Ar-Rahman, they walk the earth in humility. وَإِذَا خَاطَبَهُمُ الْجَاهِلُونَ قَالُوا سَلَامًا Right, and when the ignorant address them, right, and try to provoke them in this context, قَالُوا سَلَامًا <laughs> right they're not even interested in this type of behavior in this type of exchange right they're too busy <laughs> in fact with you know doing good deeds tending to the business and the affairs uh, of the their family and their community to even be have the time to engage right and they understand the the virtue that they're being called to as, as muslims as well Right. And those are only a few examples um, from the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I do want to conclude with the last virtue and highlight Ibrahim alayhi salam, who was inclined towards forgiveness. He was inclined, so inclined, that was his default, forgiveness. Right. That when his father actually threatened him, right. And he rebuked him and he kicked him out of the house. Are you, you know, turned off by my deities, O Ibrahim? And if you do not stop, then I am going to stone you to death. Can you imagine this? Right? Your beloved father, who is upon falsehood and who is wrong, and you're only trying to save him. He rejects you in this way and he threatens to actually stone you to death. And then he says, get out of my sight. Leave me alone. Right? He kicks you out right? for, for a while. Right? You would think that 
you know, Ibrahim salam would break everything in the house, <laughs> like, you know, or respond with frustration and anger, right? And, and disrespect, you know, the idea of fighting fire with fire, right? Rather, what did he do? First, he says, peace be upon you. You wish for me harm, I wish for you peace, <laughs> right? I wish for you something better, right? So he's winning. He's winning in this situation, right? You wish for me harm, I wish for you peace. And I am going to seek forgiveness for you from my Lord, right? So he responds and he repels evil with good, right? And he is inclined towards forgiveness more so than he is inclined towards punishment, right? The first person who insults us, the first person who we don't feel welcomed around them, you know, then, you know, we cast this person into the fire. You know, we make dua against this particular person, right? But that's not the default. The default is to be inclined towards forgiveness. And so inclined towards forgiveness was Ibrahim alayhi salam that he put his neck on the line. That's the virtuous thing about Ibrahim alayhi salam you know, wanting to make dua, you know, despite it being forgiven, uh, forbidden, is that he actually put his neck on the line with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala regarding the salvation of another individual. Look at the inclination towards forgiveness. Look at the virtue in that. Even though Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he drew the line, right? The inclination is what's virtuous, right? And that should still be there. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he actually praised Ibrahim alayhi salam when he said, Inna Ibrahim ala halimun mubin. Right? That Ibrahim alayhi salam, he is uh, tolerant and he is kind and he is repentant. Right? And then you have Ibrahim alayhi salam uh, disputing with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or pleading with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on, on behalf of the people of Lut. Right, despite what they were doing, despite their transgressions and uh, the magnitude of the action that they were doing, he still pleaded with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on behalf of the people of Lut, give them some more time. Right, give them a little bit more time. Right, and again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he drew the line, Ya Ibrahim, a'rid an hadha. Right, Ibrahim, leave, leave this alone. Right. I understand your inclination towards forgiveness, right? But this is where we draw the line, right? And lastly, we know how much Ibrahim, alayhi salam, he despised the idols. Yes or no, right? We know how much he despised the idols and he, how much he despised idolatry, right? To the point that he would prefer to be burned alive than to accept that falsehood can you imagine right and how much he regarded the truth that he would rather be you know catapulted into a pit of fire <laughs> in front of all of the people right before he would accept falsehood right yet ibrahim alayhi salam still hesitated to make dua against the idols this is his inclination towards forgiveness right as he complained to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he said rabbi inna hunna adlalna kathira min nas that these idols they have caused to stray so many people right so many people right and so he continues he says faman tabi'ani fa innahu minni and so whoever follows me then certainly he is from me, right? He is from me, he is with me, he is of my uh, uh, pedigree, right? And you would think in the Arabic language that the opposite is about to come, right? What naturally would follow is that whoever, you know, follows me is from me and whoever doesn't follow me is not from me. This is the natural trend in the Arabic language. But Ibrahim alayhi salam, he breaks that trend because of his inclination towards forgiveness, saying, minni wa man fa rahim. 
that whosoever follows me, then he is from me, and whoever rebels against me, then indeed you are the forgiving and the merciful. SubhanAllah, right? He is invoking the mercy and the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? Still trying to find a way towards mercy, right? And that is the point that his inclination towards mercy, you know, superseded, right? And overcame his inclination towards wrath and punishment, right? And so these are just a glimpse into the virtues of the Quran, you know, and some of the benefits that we can derive, especially in the coming months, uh, the coming month of Ramadan, when we're going to be reading and rehearsing the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, pay attention to the virtues, pay attention to the character that is being highlighted, because this is no ordinary character. Rather, this is a character that is superlative. So as I begin, Indeed, this Quran guides to that which is most right. And it, only, it not only guides, but to conclude the verse, it incentivizes virtue. How? In a way that no other book can, right? By pointing us towards a reward. And it gives good news to those who believe and do good deeds that for them, there is a major reward, right? So not only is it calling us to virtue, but it incentivizes it by giving us a major reward that we can aim to, that would drive us to pursue virtue of the highest caliber. So with that being said, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a character that reflects the Quran. And may we truly uh, come out of Ramadan better people, not just people who stood and prayed and read, but people who refined their character. And lastly, as I said, a Muslim should never be outdone. He should never be outraced. Remember that in terms of character. Never let anyone outrace you to good, right? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you all and may he reward you all. And may we be of those who hear the reminder and adhere to the reminder. Allahumma ameen. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik wa ashadu an la ilaha la anta wa astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Jazakumallahu khaira. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate this. I took so many notes. <laughs> yeah. And I plan on continuing to like replay this video. It was very beneficial. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Um, thank yeah, you so much. Up. Thank you. We've been trying to get you on. So I'm happy that you were able to come this year. Alhamdulillah. Uh, thank you to everybody that's been tuning in. Inshallah, tune in tomorrow. Imam Rashad from uh, Atlanta Mashit will be on tomorrow night. He was supposed to be on Monday, but alhamdulillah, he will be on tomorrow. And continue to tune in, inshallah. Um, thank you again, Ibrahim. <laughs> alhamdulillah, thank you all for having me. It was definitely a privilege and an honor. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, bless you and bless those who are putting this dawah effort forward. Um, especially in the month of Ramadan, inshallah. I mean, shukran. Keep us in your dua, inshallah. <laughs> All right, everyone. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.